The Sea Earth Globe and Its Monstrous Hypothetical Motions by Albert Smith Perspective, True and False 1. All parallel lines, like those of a railway, seem to approach and finally to meet in the distance. 2. Straight lines above the eye of the spectator appear to descend to the eye line. 3. The horizontal, or eye line, is a straight line on a level with the eye, at whatever elevation the spectator may be. 4. Lines or objects below the eye line, remaining at the same level, seem to rise as they recede, until they vanish in the eye line. 5. Similarly, lines or objects above the height of the spectator, and maintaining a constant altitude, appear to descend until they are lost in the eye line. 6. Objects or lines do not all vanish at the same point in the horizontal line, but the nearer they are to that line, the sooner they vanish in it, because of the smaller angle they make with it. 7. The distant horizon being always on a level with the eye, whatever be the altitude of the observer, it seems to rise, or to fall, with the observer, but he never has occasion to depress his vision to look downwards towards it, nor upwards. Now let us apply these rules, which are the laws of true perspective, to the disappearance of ships at sea, as illustrated in zetetic diagrams and violated in those of the globularist. First, take figure 10 on the title page. The intelligent reader will soon see that this zetetic diagram harmonizes with and illustrates the first six rules above given. The hull of the vessel, being near the eye line, vanishes, according to rule 6, before the flags and upper sails, which are farther from it, because the lower angle is the lesser. Besides, the hull rides on a dark background of water, while the upper masts and sails are often against a bright sky. But the ship never goes over and then down on the further side of a bulge or a hill of water. For in clear weather, a good telescope, which magnifies the distant angle of vision, brings again the ship's hull in sight. Had the ship gone over and beyond the supposed dip or curvature, no telescope could fetch it back again. And when, on the crest of the supposed hill of water, the hull itself should become visible against the background of a clear sky. But in harmony with Rule 4, ships never so disappear, because there is no real rise or protuberance in a calm sea, which, as we have abundantly shown, is everywhere level or horizontal. Let us now turn to the false perspective sometimes given in globite diagrams and books on geography. Our figure 11 is taken from a high-class school book, and in Scott's Astronomy there is another on the same principle, or rather, on the same lack of principle. This diagram violates every law of true perspective. The observer at A is made to look down to his distant horizon, and so is the one at B, though in the diagram he appears to look up. This is a double violation of Rule 7, as given above, and further, the reader will notice how the feet of the observers are not pointing towards the center as they should be if the Earth be globular. The diagram is a scientific fraud. Whether intentional or unintentional, we need not here discuss. Suppose the observer at A were to turn round and to look downwards in the opposite direction towards G, what would he see? an awful chasm at which the stoutest heart would quail? The thing, and the ideas it represents, are a disgrace to modern education. Is it any wonder, therefore, that a famous writer like Goethe should say, I curse this modern theory of cosmogony, and hope that perchance there may appear some strong scientist of genius who will take up the courage to upset this universally disseminated delirium of lunatics? In figure 11, we have shown an illustration used to support the false perspective and false teaching of the schools. But while some of the higher class astronomical books do not disgrace their pages with such a palpable monstrosity, their teachings are in agreement therewith, and some of their diagrams equally faulty. Let an observer be placed on some small island in mid-ocean, as represented in figure 12, where he can watch ships sail away from him in opposite directions. Now, if figure 11 be a true picture of the surface shape of the sea, and the observer on turning round sees a similar rise of the water on opposite sides, 
then the surface of the ocean would consist of a series of bulges, continued ad infinitum, as indicated by figure 12. Now let there be a series of observers, as implied in figure 13. The first observer on the right sees the vessel Mount Hill number 1. At this point, let there be another observer watching the same ship going in the same direction. He should see it mount up Hill number 2. And a third observer, similarly placed, should see the vessel still mounting up Hill number 3, and so on, up towards the moon. This would agree with the theory that the moon temporarily attracts the waters of the ocean. But who would trust himself to that theory to make the voyage? We may well leave the theory of a globular sea to the reprobation of all honest thinkers. Yet Sir Robert Ball, in common with some other astronomers, maintains that an observer on the seashore, in watching a receding vessel, actually views it mounting a hill, or a protuberant part of the ocean, until it reaches the horizon, when it begins to descend. If the sea earth were a globe, the observer should always be placed on top, near the sea level, and the receding ship should at once begin to descend. But as perspective requires objects below the eye line to appear to rise in the distance, the globularist is thus unconsciously constrained to yield this testimony as a concession to truth. In calculating the amount of curvature or dip below the eye line of the observer, we have a simple rule, ignoring some small decimal points, namely, square the number of miles given as the distance, and multiply the product by 8 inches, and divide by 12, which will give in feet the depth of the dip from the observer's line of sight. This is true for a globe of 25,000 miles circumference. Thus, in 6 miles, there would be a dip of 24 feet, and in 12 miles, a dip of 96 feet. But in calculating the depth of the dip, zetetics often have made an unnecessary concession to the globularist by deducting from the distance of the object the place of the point where the eye line is supposed to move downwards to touch the earth or the level of the water. This is a concession to the false views of perspective given in school books, such as we have illustrated in our figure 11, and to which the student can turn. Yet in spite of this unnecessary concession, zetetics have shown that distant objects are often visible when they ought to be out of sight, and a long way below the horizon, if the sea be globular. If we turn to the laws of true perspective, as already given, we shall see that this deduction is not only unnecessary, but that, moreover, the height of the observer should in strictness be added to the amount of dip. Let us turn to figure 14 to illustrate this fact. Let the point E represent the position of the observer on the sea level. His line of sight would be a tangent to the sphere at the place of observation, as shown by the line EH, and the dip of an object at J would be represented by the line HJ. Now raise the observer to the height of the telescope at F. His line of sight is still a horizontal line in the direction of G, and parallel to EH. Therefore, the dip from G to J is manifestly greater than that from H to J. And this is true whether we reckon the dip towards the center of the globe in the direction of GL, or at right angles from the line of sight GM. We have been authoritatively assured that the curvature of water can be proved by three poles, and a notable incident is referred to on the Bedford Canal, Cambridgeshire. Quote, if three poles of exactly the same height be placed in a line, the middle one always appears higher than the other two outer ones. If a telescope be sighted along the first to the third pole, the top of the middle pole will appear above the line joining the tops of the two outer ones. The above paragraph is vague and specious. What is meant by sighting the telescope along the first pole to the third? Is it here the trick comes in? The third pole, being farthest off, will appear perspectively smaller, and the first will not be seen at all if the glass be laid along the top of it. The telescope should be placed at some distance away from the first pole, when the line of sight would be found running along the level tops of each pole. Refer to figures 14 and 15. The line of sight from A to C is not parallel to a line tangential at A, but it ought to be, if there be no trick of collimation in the telescope. But suppose pole B seems higher than C. Shift the glass along B, and add a fourth pole at D, equally high and distant. Now pole C will always appear higher than pole B, so that C is both lower and higher than B, which is absurd, as Euclid says. 
When the noted wager was tried on the Bedford Canal, the lens should have been turned halfway around to test whether there was any trick in the telescope. But J. Hampton was not sufficiently sharp. Sir A. R. Wallace was doubtless honest, but the glass may have tricked him. Through a friend, I sent him a challenge to show in print how the bet was won, promising to reply courteously, but to me he never replied. Hence of that incident we may write, rest in peace. But I retain copies of the official photographs taken at the time, in case any other globide cares to pick up my glove. My friend Parallax, Dr. Robotham, had tried many experiments on that canal between 1838 and 1862, and after the bet affair, he again went and carefully tested the water for six miles with various powerful telescopes. He found the surface perfectly level as before, and his experiments have several times been published, but never refuted. Yet the canal is still there. For proof how they cook science, see the London Daily Chronicle, January 14th, 1893. The above figure 15 illustrates the supposed curvature when, as is often the case in clear weather, a great extent of sea surface is visible looking in opposite directions, say 25 miles each way. This should give a dip of 420 feet on each side. If the sea were globular, the curvature of its surface ought to be plainly visible, especially from a balloon, for a sweep of 50 miles looking both ways, but no such curvature has ever been seen even for longer stretches, but only one vast and uniform level rising prospectively to the eye line. See figure 15b and compare it with any good seascape. Figure 15a shows what ought to be seen from a balloon, e, if the sea were globular. Many people foolishly imagine that ships can sail in a straight line due east or west, but if a line be drawn all around a sphere, it would make a circle, a chalk mark round a football, for instance. A circle is not a straight line, as I once had reason to remind an educated gentleman in a public debate. He was known, too, as the Leicester astronomer. In the above figure, the magnetic north pole is represented at N, and if a ship sailing round the outer circumference keeps the point of the compass always towards N and steers at right angles to it, the course described will be a circle. A small flat island could be circumnavigated in the same way. With a powerful magnet in the middle of the island, the ship thus describing a circle, but if a vessel took a straight line course from A, it would sail in the southwesterly direction towards SW. On a globe, it would be impossible for the horizontal needle always to point to the north magnetic pole from different parts of a spherical sea, as anyone may prove by laying a needle at various points as a tangent to a large ball. But on a flat surface, the needle always points to the center while the ship describes a circle, which double fact not only again explodes the globular theory, but establishes the truth of a plain earth and sea. We have years ago many times pointed out this fact in our literature, and as a result one professor has had the honesty to make the following confession, quote, The earth has been circumnavigated a great many times. We can journey round the globe, sometimes traveling on land, and sometimes on the sea, this would appear to be a certain proof that the Earth's surface is curved. Nevertheless, it has been pointed out that circumnavigation would be possible if the Earth had a flat surface with the north magnetic pole at its center. A compass needle then would always point to the center of the surface, and so a ship might sail due east and west, as indicated by the compass, and eventually return to the same point by describing a circle. Yet thoughtless teachers still refer to the schoolboy proof that circumnavigation proves the Earth a globe. The Earth's supposed elliptical orbit. The form of an ellipse is taken from the circumference of a conic section cut obliquely by a plane passing through both sides of the cone and not parallel to the circular base. If cut parallel to the base, it makes, of course, a circle, which decreases in size as it approaches the top point of the cone. The ellipse is something like a circle, which has been more or less flattened on opposite sides. But it is not like the circle, in having only one center, for it has two points, or foci, in the longer diameter, from which it can be constructed. Each of these points is at an equal distance from the center of the figure. We are not told how the circle got flattened. The ellipse, since Kepler's time, has long been supposed to represent the Earth's annual orbit round the Sun, and though the latest new astronomy has broken open Kepler's closed ellipse, 
Yet astronomers keep up the fiction of elliptical orbits rather than openly confess the great change which has taken place in their views of planetary motion. The great German astronomer Kepler was born in the year 1571 AD, and he invented and formulated his laws of motion between 1609 and 1618 AD. He taught that the Earth's orbit was an ellipse, with the Sun in one of the foci, and a little over twelve millions of miles from the Earth. The other focus was left empty, and it has been to let ever since. Modern astronomers have lengthened the sun's distance by nearly a hundred millions of miles, which has necessarily increased the Earth's supposed orbit more than three hundred millions of miles, but this ugly fact is not acknowledged nor permitted to detract from the great name of Kepler, lest it might also reflect upon the science of astronomy, for in this exact science the alteration of millions of miles is a mere detail. Sir Robert Ball, in his Story of the Heavens, and a big story it is too, says of this problem that Kepler, to his immortal glory, succeeded in solving and proving it to demonstration. The select Royal Astronomical Society is evidently a mutual admiration society, if nothing else. Further, on Sir Robert says that Kepler's discovery, invention, of the true shape of the planetary orbits stands out as one of the most conspicuous events of the history of astronomy. So say all of us. Great astronomers are not always good logicians, so Sir Robert further eulogizes Kepler in these words. Kepler found that the movement movements of the planets could be explained by supposing that the path in which each one moved was an ellipse. This supposition in itself was a discovery of the most commanding importance. The above confession refutes itself, but we may point out that the idea, belauded by Mr. Ball, is based on four suppositions or hypotheses. One, that the sea earth is globular. Two, that this sea earth ball is a planet or wandering star amongst other heavenly bodies. Three, that the sun is stationary in one of the foci. And four, that the orbit of the earth annually round the sun makes a closed ellipse. Assumption after assumption, and the fourth one spoiled and quietly discarded by later astronomers, as DV we shall show later on, but let us here refer to the above diagram, figure 17. The thick line ADBE represents an ellipse all closed in, and S the place of the sun in one of the foci of the longer diameter. The heavier dots on the ellipse may show the Earth's hypothetical positions for the different months of the year. Now astronomers admit that the moon travels round the Earth once a month while the globe is going round the sun. What then should be the path of the moon? neither a circle nor an ellipse, but a series of cyclodial curves, a sinuosity like the track of the serpent, but my limited space demands brevity. Look at the curve and study it, and you will find out some curious phenomena which the moon ought to manifest if their theories were true, but which she, in spite of her supposed fickleness, refuses to manifest. Trace out the path of the moon through the various signs of the zodiac in relation to the sun's fixed position. The moon would sometimes be very slow, sometimes very swift, very, sometimes stationary, and sometimes actually appearing retrograde. Yet the daily speed of the moon never varies more than two or three degrees, and the moon's motion is always direct through the twelve signs, justifying the inspired statement of the psalmist that the moon is the faithful witness in the sky. After belauding Kepler for his elliptical orbits and giving him immortal glory, Sir Robert Ball shows in his romance called The Story of the Heavens that another astronomer, and a greater than Kepler, soon after came along and ruthlessly ripped open the Keplerian skin bottle, thus spilling the gravitation wine which was supposed to be stored therein. Our friend Robert, quite unabashed, tells us in his heavenly story that Sir William Herschel, was the first to solve the noble problem as to whether the sun was really at rest in the middle of our solar system, or whether the whole system, sun, planets, and all, is not moving on bodily through space. So that after all Kepler's invention did not settle this noble problem, which was left for another to grapple with, and this one has, for the time being, settled it, that the sun is rushing us all through space at a terrible rate towards a distant star millions and millions and millions of miles away, to Lambda Hercules, a romance worthy of that classical giant whose twelve labors through the great were nothing compared to the labors now imposed on the sun god through the twelve signs of the zodiac, for in the words of our great storyteller, we are assured that, 
quote, the sun and his system are now hastening towards to a point in the heavens near the star Delta Lyra. The velocity with which the motion is performed corresponds to the magnitude of the system. Quicker than the swiftest rifle bullet that was ever fired, the sun, bearing with it the earth and all the other planets, is now speeding onwards. Every half hour, we are about 10,000 miles nearer to the constellation of Lyra. In common parlance, we may say that this is a stretcher. But what about Kepler's elliptical orbit? There is now a great gash in it, 175 million miles wide equal to the sun's present annual journey. Such a gash is surely fatal. And what about the altered orbit of the globe? Instead of an ellipse, it is now a cyclodial curve, as represented by the thick line in figure 18, and a curve showing that the globe must have reversed motion at each end of the cycle as it travels from left to right. Let the monthly positions of the globe be represented in figure 18 by the heavier dots, and it will be seen that in relation to the sun's corresponding positions, that orb would sometimes appear to be stationary in the zodiac, and at other times even retrograde. This of itself is sufficient utterly to discredit the new and latest theory of globular motion, for the sun's apparent motion through the twelve signs of the zodiac is uniformly direct as any good ephemeris of the nautical almanac will show. As to the path of the moon, it is more torturous than ever, as indicated by the dotted cycloids in the above diagram, but it would require further and larger diagrams to expose in detail this monstrous motion and movements, and our space is limited. Suffice it here to say that diagram 18 represents the moon getting in advance of the globe once every month, which would compel it to move at such an awful rate that the magnitude and duration of lunar eclipses would be enormously altered and lessened. Yet such eclipses were correctly calculated long before the time of Herschel and company. In figure 18, we have shown that the moon's monthly motions would be exceedingly erratic if the moon had to revolve all round a rapidly moving Earth, for sometimes it would have to get right in front of the globe, otherwise it could not travel all round that body. Yet the moon's daily motion of about 12 or 13 degrees is always direct through the zodiacal signs, and it never varies more than 2 or 3 degrees. But if the sun, by some astounding pulling powers, and without any physical fastenings or connections, can drag after it, in its vast and unknown journey, into boundless space, all the planets, the globe, and the moon, then these bodies, and especially the latter, should always be found in the rear. In this case, the moon would never really travel round the earth at all, neither in a circle, nor in a spiral, nor an ellipse but its movements would manifest a series of serpent-like sinuosities, as found above in figure 19. Thus again we find that the lunar orbit, under this extravagant theory, would be most unnatural and erratic. Its form may imitate its origin. Yet the moon's actual movements, as given in a practical almanac like the nautical almanac, are fairly regular and uniform, again proving the discrepancy which exists between practical astronomy, as used by navigators, and theoretical astronomy, as taught to landsmen in the schools and colleges. With natural and practical astronomy, we not only have no quarrel, but we have had great pleasure in its study for more than fifty years. But with the ever-changing unnatural and infidel speculations of the schools, true Bible Christians will wage undying warfare. In books on astronomy, we are gravely told that the sun is more than a million times larger than the sea-earth globe. The writers who make these extravagant assertions do not condescend to give us any good practical evidence in proof thereof. Their authoritative assertions are supposed to be sufficient, in spite of good authorities against them, and the oppositions of science against science. This was complained of long ago by intelligent men like John Wesley, who in his journal expressed his disbelief in the theory of Copernicus and Newton. He wrote, The more I consider them, the more I doubt all systems of astronomy. I doubt whether we can with certainty know either the distance or the magnitude of any star in the firmament. Else why do astronomers so immensely differ with regard to the distance of the sun from the earth, some affirming it to be only three, and others ninety millions of miles? When doctors disagree, who shall decide? Our God-given senses and a few practical observations. We have shown that the moon is a faithful witness in the heavens, and we may find the sun's testimony the same. Two good witnesses, when critically examined, both testifying against the extravagances of modern theories. Now look at figure 20. 
Let an observer stand by night directly under a lamp post. The light above him will cast no side shadow. If he moves northwards, his shadow will fall towards the north, and if he goes south, his shadow will fall southwards. If the light were extended by a number of gas jets above his head, say for ten feet, then on the observer moving that distance underneath, he would still see no shadow. That is, the vertical rays of the light would cast no shadow for a distance equal to its own extent. Now apply this reasoning to the shadows of vertical objects cast by the sun's rays. In northern latitudes, the shadows fall towards the earth, and in southern, towards the south. The declination of the sun varies from the Tropic of Cancer, 23.5 degrees north, to an equal declination south of the equator, the Tropic of Capricorn. Between these extremities, the sun is always, at noon, directly overhead, in places with latitudes equal to his declination, the variation in which is the cause of the varying seasons. In these places on land or at sea, the sun casts no side shadow at noon and it has been found that this phenomenon extends for 32 miles, so that the column of the sun's vertical rays is 32 miles across in every direction, a distance equal to the length of the solar diameter. And whether we take the surface of the sea as curved or horizontal, there would make little difference to the diameter, as may be seen on referring to figure 20. During the Boer War, Dr. Robertson, a medical gentleman, sailed with our troops from England to South Africa, and in 14 degrees north latitude, the vessel at noon came under the vertical rays of the sun. He discovered the fact above mentioned and published it in a book he wrote. He was a globularist at the time, but as I lost touch with him soon after reading his book, I cannot say how his discovery affected his subsequent belief. It ought to have brought him into the ranks of the plainists, and I posted him some of our literature. His book was entitled The Mutual Relations of the Sun and Earth, I do not now possess a copy, so I cannot quote directly from it, and our space is very limited. But Dr. R, by diagrams and arguments, demonstrated that the diameter of the sun is only 32 miles across. Thus the sun is a small body as compared with the size of the earth. Yet, as compared with the planets, it is a giant. And as the psalmist says, a giant rejoicing to run his race. The nautical almanac bears out the truth of the sun's comparatively small size. It gives the sun's semi-diameter as 16 minutes of a degree. One degree of latitude is equal to 60 miles, and as there are 60 minutes to a degree, twice 16 minutes must be equal to 32 miles, the sun's diameter, by no less an authority than that of the navigator's chief almanac. We are aware of the usual astronomical quibble to get over this difficulty, another assumption, the sun's immense distance, but whatever the distance may be, the sun's rays traverse it, and the column of vertical rays is only 32 miles across. The sun, therefore, witnesses to the truth of the nautical almanac, another faithful witness in the heavens. But luminous bodies often appear larger than they really are, as is sometimes illustrated by the old moon being in the arms of the new. The sun's distance and focused image. In studying this part of the subject, we must distinguish between the focused image of the sun, as sometimes seen refracted through the clouds, and that orb's position as seen at noon in a clear sky when there can be but little refraction. Figure 21 is a copy of a drawing I took years ago in latitude 52 degrees 38 minutes north and longitude 1 degree 9 minutes west, when the sun's rays were divided at an angle of about 90 degrees. On one side they fell on a church, and on the other on a tree four miles away from the church. The focused image, therefore, would be only about two miles high, a distance equal to CB, the base of a right-angled triangle. Had anyone ascended in a balloon, the focus of the light would have receded upwards, as a rainbow recedes when an observer tries to approach it, the height of the bow depending upon the observer's position and that of the sun. In judging the sun's true distance, we need a clear sky when the sun is on the meridian at noon. Taking official figures, we find the latitude of the French Bordeaux, edge of the water, given as 45 degrees north, that is, 2,700 miles north of the equator at a point in the same longitude. Reckoning 60 miles to 1 degree, now let us refer to the left half of figure 21. At the time of the equinoxes, March 21 and September 24, the sun is directly over the equator in the longitude of Bordeaux at noon, C. 
Thus, we then obtain the right-angled triangle BCS, the sun's vertical rays falling upon the point C, and making with the line CB, already proved to be level, the right angle BCS. Looking from Bordeaux towards the sun at midday, we look along the line BS, making an angle of 45 degrees with the base BC. Now in every triangle, the three angles are together equal to two right angles, hence the remaining angle BSC contains 45 degrees and is equal to the angle at B. But as Euclid proves, when two angles of a triangle are equal, the sides subtending or opposite them are also equal. Hence the base BC is equal to the perpendicular CS. In other words, the height of the sun above the flat earth is equal to the distance of Bordeaux from the equator in Africa, probably less, but certainly not more than about 2,700 miles. The various branches of truth are connected so that if we find one important branch, we can be led on to another, and similarly, if we break off one branch, we injure all. The question now arises, if the sun keeps at the same general height in its journey over the plain earth, why does it appear to go down and set? The student should again read the article on perspective, true and false, and note especially rule five there given. A balloon sailing away high above an observer appears to descend as it recedes, although retaining the same altitude. Referring to the above figure 22, an observer sitting inside a greenhouse or conservatory with a curved glass window will see phenomena something like what is there depicted. A represents the position of the observer, C the sun's position at 12 noon, and the line CF the elevation of about one-fourth of its daily path. At 1.30 p.m., the sun arrives at D, making the angle DAB an angle of about 58 degrees, with the baseline already proved to be level. At 3 p.m., the sun arrives at E, making the angle EAB of 38 degrees, or a descent from C of about 52 degrees. At 6 p.m., the sun arrives at F, a distance from C of nearly three times its height, and the angle of its rays drops to about 22 degrees, and sometimes to only 18 degrees. Thus the fact is made clear that even by perspective alone, the sun seems to drop almost to the horizon while remaining at the same height. If the sun were a non-luminous body, it would disappear sooner, as a balloon disappears. There are details which we cannot here stop to consider, such as variations in the time of sunset caused by alterations in its declination. The speed of the sun itself varies, hence we find a good clock sometimes said to be fast and sometimes slow, according to the time of year and the size of the sun's circle over the earth. These are points which can be studied with the aid of a good astronomical almanac or ephemeris, but I may briefly intimate the general law of motion for celestial bodies. As far back as the year 1900, I published these laws of motion, which are much simpler than those of Kepler, which later astronomers have spoiled, as shown in a previous article, and which we have altogether exploded. General Laws of Celestial Motion 1. There seems to be two great ethereal currents eternally revolving round their respective centers, one north and the other south, like two immense cogwheels revolving harmoniously in opposite directions. The ethereal currents doubtless supplied the premium mobile of the ancients. These currents move most rapidly above and around the equatorial belts, like the water in the middle of a stream, becoming slower towards the poles or centers of the wheels. Two. The planets, sun, moon, and stars, being comparatively small and light bodies, are carried daily round the world by these all-powerful currents at different altitudes, according to their various densities, the higher currents moving them more rapidly than those lower or nearer the surface of the Earth. Therefore, three, the more rapidly a planet revolves daily round the Earth, and the higher its altitude, and the nearer it is to the fixed stars, which are the highest of all, which fact is illustrated by Neptune and Uranus, which keep a long time in the same zodiacal signs. 4. The nearer a planet is to the Earth, and the more slowly it revolves, like Venus and Mercury, thus more rapidly getting left behind by the higher planets and constellations, and so passing through the signs more quickly, or strictly the signs leaving the planet more quickly. 5. The moon, which is the lowest of the heavenly bodies, the one nearest to the Earth, 
gets left behind by the fixed stars as much as 12 degrees to 14 degrees daily, thus passing through all the 12 signs of the zodiac in a lunar month. This makes the globularist imagine that the moon has what they call a proper motion, in a direction contrary to that of her apparent daily motion. And if a planet keeps in conjunction with a fixed star for a few days, they call it stationary. If it loses a little on a star, it is said to be direct. And if it should gain a little on a star, they actually call it retrograde to suit their theories. Thus the motions of the celestial bodies are governed by the ethereal currents, according to their heights and declinations, their actual speeds being quicker the nearer they are to the great equatorial belts, and their circles or spirals becoming smaller, and speeds slower as they approach nearer the north or south centers. This causes their daily revolutions to consist of a series of very fine spirals as they vary their declinations, the north and south centers being the earthly focal points of the two great vortices, or ethereal whirlpools, which carry with them the planets, the sun, and the moon, and sometimes make them pass over from one great whirlpool to another. This causes the seasons, and some lunar changes, with the various planetary periods or cycles of time. These, with the eclipse cycles, are of great utility in celestial chronology. As the previous chapter was longer, my limits require this to be shorter, so I must put the maximum of meaning in the minimum of words. In the previous chapter, it was shown how, by perspective alone, the sun appears to descend almost to the horizon, although remaining that day at its average altitude of between two and three thousand miles. In diagram 22, we made no allowance for refraction, which would have still further reduced each of the angles, and especially the lower ones. Diagram 23 supplies the emission, and illustrates how the sun descends to and disappears on the distant horizon. Light is a very subtle force, and one of the most easily refracted from the rectilinear. But like all other forces, it takes the line of least resistance, whether in a curve or in a line practically straight. Its undulations falling from above onto the atmosphere are refracted or reflected more and more according to the angle at which they strike and the density of the media through which they pass. We need not here enter into the unsettled question of the density of the luminiferous ether, especially as optical density is not always the same as physical density. A straight rod, when dipped into water, appears suddenly bent to an outsider above that element. But in judging the refraction of the sun's rays, we need to remember that we are inside the refracting element and one which has varying density. Hence those rays of the sun which strike the atmosphere very obliquely, as from F to G, instead of proceeding in a straight line to the Earth's surface below H, take the line of least resistance and proceed towards the spectator at A. Now an observer always sees an object in the direction of the rays entering the eye. Therefore, the observer at A will see the sun's image in the direction of the line AHF setting on the distant horizon. The sun is never seen below the horizon, but at the vernal equinox at 6 p.m., if the earth was a globe, the center of the sun would be 90 degrees below the horizon, while its upper and lower limbs would stretch above and below thousands of miles if the sun were the size the astronomers assert. The sun's rays can be entirely cut off from a spectator at the sea level, as at A, while its reflected light can still be seen by observers in higher altitudes, from a high balloon, or from the top of a mountain. There is an angle of total reflection where the light being reflected upwards off the denser atmosphere does not penetrate to the surface of the Earth as along the lines FKN. A flat stone thrown obliquely onto the smooth surface of a lake may strike the water, unseen by a fish far below, and leap upwards again and again before sinking by its own weight and as the sun's lower limb is the first to arrive at the angle of total reflection, it is naturally first cut off. Horizontal Eclipses The above diagram is a copy of one by a fellow worker in the cause of truth, who is now at the front in his capacity of electrical engineer. He says, quote, According to the globular theory, a lunar eclipse occurs when the sun, earth, and moon are in a direct line. But it is on record that since about the 15th century, over 50 eclipses have occurred while both sun and moon have been visible above the horizon. The accompanying illustration shows how utterly impossible it is to harmonize this fact with the globularist theory. A remarkable instance of this kind was observed at Paris on the 19th of July, 1750, 
when the moon appeared visibly eclipsed while the sun was distinctly to be seen above the horizon. Two other instances are given in McCullough's geography, dates September 20th, 1717, and April 20th, 1837, and the London Almanac for 1864 gives four other dates. Sometimes an ill-informed globite denies the possibility of such eclipses, thus tacitly acknowledging that they are inconsistent with the globular theory. Then, when he is convicted by accredited astronomical testimony, he suddenly turns round and as ignorantly shouts, Refraction! Let any intelligent astronomer attempt to show how refraction can reflect upwards two great lights with full clear disks, when according to his theory the centers of both lights should be ninety degrees below the horizon, to say nothing of their lower limbs. Yet here we have two orbs occasionally coming and smiling down upon us for our folly. I believe that all lunar eclipses occurring about sunset would be seen to be horizontal eclipses by observers if they were only in suitable positions. Others object that the Earth's shadow on the moon is always round. We need not pursue the enemy down to every dirty shell hole into which he rushes for cover. Suffice to note that here are three more assumptions. One, the Earth's shadow which we have fully exploded. Two, that it is always round. And three, that only a globe can give a curved shadow on a sphere. Go by night into a room with only one light and take a flat ruler and an orange or a larger ball and you will find that a flat piece of wood can cast a curved shadow on the ball. Astronomers confess that there are many dark bodies in the heavens, some of which could doubtless cause an eclipse, though we do not here assert that they do. As there is a focus of light, so there is a definite focal point of darkness opposite, and when the moon, which has a lesser light of her own, gets inside this dark focus, her rays and her influence is seriously interfered with, a fact well known to astrologers. Her light is not entirely cut off, as we have seen the whole of the moon's face a dark copper color at the moment of the totality of the eclipse, the moon having a peculiar light of her own, very different from the sunlight. Eclipses were predicted hundreds of years before the Copernican theory was invented, to say nothing of the latter new astronomy. Thales, about 600 years before Christ, and the great astrologer Ptolemy predicted eclipses hundreds of years in advance and Zetetics, who possess past tables of eclipses, can predict others, for they occur in cycles or periods of eighteen years, ten and one-third days, and have nothing to do with the globular theory. In fact, they could not be calculated on the latest globite speculations, as the following illustration will show those who are willing to see. Let a taxi drive round a large square, as it spins along, let a horseman ride his pegasus round and round the taxi, and suppose a swallow squealing and circling round the pegasus, when and where would these three bodies, representing sun, earth, and moon, fall into line with the principal avenue of the square? Who would calculate this problem, especially if they did not know either the size of the square or the velocities of the moving bodies? No eclipse could last out half its present duration, yet eclipses with their magnitudes and durations are still calmly tabulated and ill-informed globites imagine that this is another proof of the truth of modern astronomical theories. Zetetics owe much to a London medical gentleman who last century, under the nom de plume of Parallax, revived the Zetetic cause by his able writings and powerful lectures. But it is seldom given to pioneers to dig out all the truths they unearth. Hence, early Zetetics only acknowledged one pole, no evidence of a south pole having then been actually discovered by Antarctic explorers. It was left for Zetetes principally to carry on the war, and to be the first Zetetic to acknowledge the proved existence of two so-called poles. This he did many years ago in various articles published in a book entitled Zetetic Astronomy, now sold out of stock, and also in lectures in different parts of the country, and in public debates. He was the first editor of the Earth Not a Globe Review. At the same time, it was shown that these so-called poles are not the two termini of the Earth's imaginary axis, but rather the north and south centers of solar and stellar celestial motion. Stars with north declination revolve daily around a central star in the north called Polaris, and stars with south declination around a southern center near Sigma Octantis. An objector in New Zealand sent the writer some photographs he had taken showing what he called star trails around a southern center and which he wanted me to believe were globe trails, or caused by the rotation of the Earth. I accepted the photos as honest and genuine proofs of southern star motion, 
but I insisted on the title the photographer himself had given them. They were star trails, and nothing more. In fact, the rotation of the globe would have produced different lines, especially of those stars, passing directly over the latitude of the photographer, so that when properly understood, they were against the globular theory, and not a proof of it. The fixed stars are so called because, except for very long periods, they do not appreciably alter their relative positions, and they are mere points of light, so small that the most powerful telescopes cannot magnify them into disks. Yet they are supposed to be suns of immense size, removed by the astronomers to immeasurable distances away from us, for the credit and convenience of their theories, yet not so far that they profess to be able to find a parallax for many of them. The star Alpha Centauri is said to be one of the nearest to us, and it has been given a parallax of 0 0.75. But if it were a sun of such size, even though it were many times farther off than it is said to be, it would show in the telescope a distinct disk of at least half a second, so that the contention of Sir A. R. Wallace is here justified. The fact that there are no stars with visible disks proves that there are no suns of the required size. But the sun, moon, and planets have disks or faces of various sizes, some very small, and they wander from the north circuit to the south and vice versa, according to their seasons and times. Thus the sun daily revolves around the north center for six months, then it crosses into the south circuit for six months. Thus its light, as the psalmist long since told us, reaches from one end of the heaven to the other. The question has been asked, if the sun crosses from the northern circuit to the southern, how is it so little difference is observable in its positions? The above diagram, figure 25, will help the student to understand this more intricate part of the subject, but we must remember that there is a great difference between the motions of the solar orb and the motions of light which proceed in every direction away from it. The motions of the celestial bodies we have already explained in connection with figure 22, and we have also shown that the equator is a broad belt of vertical rays and not a mere imaginary line. We will refer to figure 25. At the vernal equinox, the sun is at E in the morning at 6 a.m. Its light traveling round with the ethereal currents is seen at the same moment by an observer at A. Now an observer always sees an object in the direction of the rays entering the eye, and the curve of about 6,000 miles from E to A is so great that for the last few miles, the rays seem to come to A in a straight line in the direction from H. Hence he sees the sun's image rise due east, not northeast, proving that light travels in great curves. In the same way, observers at A and at M see their different sun images at I and at T, but it is self-evident that the orb of the sun itself cannot be in these various positions at one and the same time. Six hours later, the sun itself arrives from E to A, and it may happen that then its swirl outwards from N drives it into the southern current, and it goes round with that current in the direction of the arrow until it arrives at P, when its light, preceding it in a great curve, the sun's image is again seen at H from A. It then goes round with the southern currents daily, contracting its circle in a fine spiral until it arrives at 23 and a half south latitude, when, having lost its further southern tendency or swirl, electrical and magnetic forces, doubtless under intelligent supervision, drive it again northwards. Similarly, explanations apply to the moon and to the planets, but with different periods, owing to their different altitudes, as already explained in the former article. The sundial. If you have not got an ordinary sundial, fix in your garden an upright pole or rod with a ball on the top of it, say in England or in any country with good north latitude, and at the time of the vernal equinox, then from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., peg out the positions of the shadows of that ball every quarter of an hour, and draw a line along the pegs. You will find it makes a great curve, about half of an ellipse, with the longer diameter, as in the inset N-O-R-T. If your rod was at the North Pole, the shadow would make a semicircle. At sunrise, the light circling round casts the shadow of the pole at O towards R. And as the sun works round to the south of your dial, the shadow of the pole will go northwards towards T. Similarly, when the sun works round to the west, the shadow gradually curves round to N in the east. When living in London many years ago, I frequently tried this experiment in my back garden, as also a similar one on the flat housetop with a shorter rod or stylus.
Now if the moving daylight has been caused by the rotation of the earth, the shadows of that ball in the garden, or of the knob of the shorter upright stick on the housetop would have fallen in a straight line. Test the truth of this by an experiment with an orange or a larger ball in a dark room illuminated by one lamp. Place an upright stylus near the center of a flat and stationary table, and carefully carry the light halfway around. You will get the sundial curve. Then fix a match in the orange, and place the light in the center of the stationary table, and squarely rotate the orange. If you do so honestly and properly, you will get a short straight line according to the proportions of your experiment. Thus the sundial, the shadows of our lamp posts in the city squares, and the shadows of our tall trees in the city parks, all testify, often daily, to the great fact that we are living on a plain and stable earth with the light of heaven daily revolving around. so much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video presentation if you did please subscribe to my youtube channel like the video and share it on your favorite social media sites there's a lot more to come so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time